Okay, friends. Now we are starting for a very interesting presentation. I think Vikas and Pradeep have uh, done a lot of work on this. I think we sincerely appreciate their efforts for the kind of enthusiasm they have shown to keep on giving answers to so many questions raised by so many of our members. I think everybody's put something different in each of these questions. If you read all the mails right from May 17th till date, four weeks of constant work has going on. And I think he's got so many suggestions to cover. Vikas, will you be able to cover everything first? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, fine. If you're agreed and we have the attendance, we can do it. It should not happen that after three meetings, people stop coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they have, uh, have a lot of preparation. And uh, just to introduce, I think Vikas is a well-known person among all of us. He's always in the midst of the question and answer sessions. <laughs> he always has lots to ask. And today, he'll have lots to answer also. <laughs> and Mr. Pradeep, I think, requires no introduction. He's been uh, a father figure for all banking things, at least as far as our council is concerned. Uh, representing with, uh, the, he's with, been CBI with the fraud uh, department. So I think he'll have a lot more insights to give. I hand it over to them to begin the presentation. So I'm just thinking that how many questions you guys are going to answer. He already asked 10. I have a list of some 25, 30. So, so, uh, so uh, before we start, first of all, thanks to KM team. Uh, in one call itself, Mr. Suresh was agreed that, OK, uh, we'll give you as much time as you want. And then all the members uh, to suggest topics and all that. So before we start, just uh, one minute uh, background about uh, what is our idea uh, in this session. So uh, as we all know that uh, uh, you already mastered something or the other, right? So somebody has been dealing in mutual fund, somebody in financial planning, some of you uh, may be doing insurance, tax consultancy, many other things. So idea here is not to make you a banking analyst. You already know what you have to do. Uh, but can you add something uh, to your banking knowledge? So if it, in this room, if I see the average age is some 40 years. And uh, if we say some 60 years is kind of your uh, working years, so another 20 years are left. If we can share something today, and if you can follow the theme for next one, two, three year, by the time uh, this room turns out 43 on an average basis, and if you can apply all those learnings for next 17 years, then uh, are we better off or are we not? So that has been the good, uh, the full idea. And uh, uh, we already read a lot related to banking sector. So uh, now the idea is directly to take you the, to the main resources, whether it is RBI, company management, or uh, so uh, now without taking much time, I'll hand it over to Mr. Pradeep. We have uh, a lot of content to share. So one a small request to you is in part one and part two, we are basically going to share the terminologies so that you can relate to the, uh, the concepts what we are going to discuss in part three. So uh, whenever you are asking a question in one and two, ask a question if you are not understanding what is there in the slide. For all the big discussion and so to say bank is storming, we will be doing in the third part. Uh, so that's all. We'll share one piece of paper with all of you so that you can keep a track that how far we have come in and how much we have to go uh, from here. Before I start, a uh, slight correction as to what uh, Jay said. The basic uh, research is all uh, Vikas. I'm only the front, OK? Now, the program is structured in such a way. First, I'll get you, walk you through what exactly is NPA, how the bank, uh, I mean, what you keep hearing about, even in the quiz, he asked a question, Basel. And we keep hearing about Basel norms, one, two, three, and all those things. I'll be walking you through this particular thing. Then he will take it, uh, he'll be taking you through how it plays a role in, the, in understanding a balance sheet of a bank. Right? Now, let me start with a story. Uh, there was an incident which happened in 1985-86 in Singapore, which led to the thought of this particular Basel norms and other things which came into picture. Now, 
there was a person called Nick Leeson. Now, Leeson was a person who was an intern with Bank of America and that was the time when basically derivatives were just taking, uh, uh, getting its popularity. And this boy was picked up by a bank called as Bearings Bank. Now, Bearings Bank was basically promoted by the royalty of England, right? The Queen of England herself had a huge stake in that particular bank. So, he was made a in charge of derivatives and Singapore was the place where, uh, what do you say, the derivatives were being traded in a very huge scale. So, Leeson was posted as the in charge of derivatives in Singapore. Now, he started his derivatives career. He had half knowledge, but then he improved upon it with a criminal intent, right? So, his pay, as we in the modern day, we call it CTC. That was the same thing there. It was a contractual thing. Up to certain amount, he will get a salary, and thereafter, the bonuses were dependent on how much profit he generates out of the derivatives. Now, he started betting on the Nike derivatives on, uh, based on Nike index. And in the pro when he was going wrong, he created a fictitious account said to be some customer. And all the losses or profit, uh, all the losses were being booked to that and profits were being shown whenever there is a profit, they, it was being shown. And his greed went so much that he started uh, not just speculating, it, he, was, he started gambling on the Nike. He started gambling on the Nike and uh, the auditors who came to audit this derivatives thing knew nothing, no, they didn't even know what a derivative is. They only looked at certain things in the uh, this thing and they said everything is fine. This went on for three years and one fine day the Nike where he had bet upon the Nike going up by something and it came, fell down by 11,000 points one single day. And that day afternoon, he, when people went asking or searching for him, they found a yellow slip which said, sorry. That was the only word that was written on that. And he had already fled with his wife to Malaysia. And as it happens in movies, the police always was ending up after he had left. He went on hopping from one country to another country. Finally, he was caught when he had boarded the plane uh, Lufthansa Airlines in Germany. That's when they caught him. They brought him to Singapore. He was tried for it. He got a three years imprisonment. And he's currently the coach, football coach of Tottenham Spurs in the British Premier League. Right? Huh? Yeah. Now, Tottenham Spurs, he is one of the coaches there. Now, but this led to a thinking. BIS, which is the Bureau of International Settlements, now they are the central bank's supervisors in a way. Now, they started a body called as BCBS. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't tell you the full thing. Okay. The Bearings Bank literally became bear. Okay. And it was bought for one pound by ING. Right. The Queen herself lost, I'm talking of 87, 88, somewhere around 12 billion pounds in that bank. So, this is what led to a thought. Around the same time, there was another foreign exchange fraud which happened in uh, a bank in Ireland. So, BIS started working on this and they looked at, they decided to link all the assets to the capital. Now, if you look at the banking, how it started, who bears the brunt of any loss? No. The depositors, the sh uh, capital will be less in the liabilities. You have the fixed deposits, the casas and all those coming in and you are lending based on this, right? So, when the loan goes bad, ultimately when the bank fails, it's the depositors who face this. So, they wanted to overcome this and that's when 
they came up with the Basel I. Basel I came up and in 1988 and in Basel I, the first thing they said in Basel I was about first is credit risk. Credit risk was the first thing that was taken up in uh, Basel I. No, ye baad mein lagega, abhi nahi. Now, Basel I came up with credit risk. Credit risk, credit always has a counterparty risk. It may be willful, it may be because of environmental considerations that a credit may go bad. Now, when a credit goes bad, how one needs to look at? That's when they came up with what is called as uh, asset classification. Now, they brought in a thing called as, two things came in. One was asset classification, second was income recognition and third what was called as risk weighted assets. That means your asset depending on whom you have lent to, there will be a risk percentage or a risk weight attached to it. That was the thing that came in. Now the balance sheet and profit and loss are so, I mean it is connected in such a way that if your assets are bad earlier whether you get your interest or not, you would always book it as a income. Just as we do it in the other trading or manufacturing, any credit sales, we book it as a thing that comes in. Now, they decided, you think about the assets. What are the assets? What's the risk weight? And if it is not standard or it is going bad, then you make a provision. You also don't consider interest that has accrued but not received, you are not going to book it. You are not going to book it, right? So what is going to happen? It's a double whammy. You don't book your income, at the same time you make provisions. That's where the banking sector gets hit. That's where the banking sector gets hit and it's because of the risk weightage and the income recognition. What in India, uh, the first circular the, that Vikas sent to you, this Reserve Bank uh, circular is about IRAC norms. That is IRAC is income recognition and asset classification, right? Now, asset classification, assets were basically classified into standard and non-performing assets. Now, they worked out certain norms. Assets were basically classified as standard and non-performing assets. The middle one is a recent thing which came in after Basel II, but the Basel I basically split it into, okay. Basel I specifically split it into two, standard and non-performing. Under non-performing, again, there are some which are temporarily bad, there are some which have been ongoing, they have been bad in an ongoing manner and there are some where there is a doubt that you, whether you will be able to get back or not and the last one that you, you are definite that you are not going to get it. There another point that came up, once the Basel I started off, later on they found there were quite a few loopholes which still existed and they brought in another uh, thing called as Basel Norm II. Now that came up in 2003. In Basel Norm 2, what they did was, they looked at one, the supervisory part of it, how the supervisor, that's the central banks have to look at it and also brought in, uh, I mean they split the risk into three types. Credit risk, that is their basic thing when I give a loan, what are the credit risks that are involved, two, market risk. Now, for SLR, most of the banks buy bonds. They also carry risks. They also carry risks. Now, in India, of course, it is not permitted, but abroad, any bank can invest up to 5% of their total deposits in market-related investments that includes equities. That includes equities, right? In India, of course, we have been very conservative. At times it has helped us, at times it has gone against us, but then we don't have, our basic market risk is based on the bond market itself, not much on anything else. 
Third that they brought in was one of the most important thing called as the operational risk. Now what do you think is operational risk? Exactly. It deals with men, that is the staff, it deals with systems and procedures, it deals with your IT. There can be frauds, huge frauds just because your IT is not okay or your systems and procedures have a loophole. People exploit those loopholes and in the modern day what has happened is your systems and procedures have got integrated into IT. So if there is a loophole in your systems and procedures automatically it gets exploited through IT. I myself had done a audit of one of the banks here. Of course, I won't be giving you the bank <laughs> names, but then when I found that it was in the IT that the system was not totally integrated. It was not totally integrated and the concerned branch manager went on increasing limits. Though the sanction limit was some X crores, he went on increasing the limits. That is because the IT did not carry the systems there. After a certain limit, it should stop allowing withdrawals from the account and that he permitted by because the IT did not have those flags. You need to have what are called as flags. For each level, you need to have a flag so that they use their discretionary power. He even uh, went to the extent of using the powers of central board of that bank. So you can imagine central board and this happened somewhere in 1998 and uh, the central board's power at that time was 500 crores. So you can imagine <laughs> and whereas the actual thing was within his powers which was 5 crores. Yeah, you, it depends where you put it. Zero has no value, but it depends where you put it, this side or the other side, right? <laughs> so now he has put it on the other side in some of the slides, <laughs> right? So we have a tendency of putting it at 6% or 5%, he says 0, 6%. He has to be very specific. I won't be reading this, I will <laughs> carry you. Uh, then what they did was, when they did this in the... Uh, Basel norm 1, they brought in a form of, uh, they divided the capital that the bank should have based on their assets. Now remember, when you are dealing with a manufacturing concern or a trading concern, the asset types are different. You have fixed assets, current assets. Here, assets means exclusively loans, exclusively loans, right? Now, these loans, each category where whom you have given it to. Now suppose I have given it to a, a multinational uh, organization or something like that, then the risk weight was supposed to be zero or it, if it is a sovereign loan that I have given or a government related thing, the risk weight was supposed to be zero. If it is to a public sector or something like that, then depending on what kind and all, it would be 5, 10, 20 and 100. All off balance sheet items. Now, banks carry a lot of off-balance sheet items. What are off-balance sheet items? Guarantees. Only guarantees? Hmm? It is one of the major items. No, the major item in off-balance sheet that the banks carry are LCs, letter of credits. Now, letter of credit is just a piece of paper where they say, I am going to give if he is not going to give. Right? And that person leverages on it. But if he does not, the borrower does not, then it falls on the bank because you have already given the bank guarantees also come into picture. That is uh, uh, what we call non-fund based business of the bank is LC and bank guarantees. Now off balance sheet items, how many people look at the annual report and look at these? The off balance sheet our items do not come in the balance sheet, but they are given as a given in the notes or this. How many people really look into it? You don't. So, bank shareholders are also taken into, I mean, taken for a ride, the uh, everything. So, they said for off balance sheet items, you have to make a provision, I mean, risk weight of 100%. There was a time when people could take bank guarantees without security or issue LCs without security. 
because of Basel 1, banks started demanding security for even off balance sheet things, whether it is uh, LC or whether it is a bank guarantee. Mostly the bank guarantees would be issued without security, that changed, the whole process changed. So everything had to be looked at from risk point of view, that happened, right. Now, they said the capital will be of two types and that capital should be on the basis of your risk weighted assets. It should be a percentage of your risk weighted assets, right. Now again when we look at non-banking uh, balance sheets, you just have a authorized, subscribed, paid up and all those things. Here we have certain things which are designated as tier 1 capital and certain things are called as tier 2 capital. What constitutes a tier 1 capital? Basically the capital, share capital is the tier 1 capital or you know banks uh, incidentally carry certain reserves which are not disclosed, which is which are called as undisclosed. The Banking Regulation Act permits it and uh, the Reserve Bank of India Act in India permits it. Where, uh, same is the case abroad also where banks normally carry some undisclosed reserves which are not disclosed. Now they were brought in and uh, then we, they said you could issue what are called as subordinated bonds. Now what do you understand by subordinated? Subordinated bonds means now they are almost at par with your equity thing when it comes to the winding up of a bank other bond holders will be paid first and then come the subordinated bonds right they automatically carry a slightly higher rate of interest compared to this. In India incidentally SBI was the one which was the first bank to issue subordinated bonds. So they brought in what are called a uh, lot of things which were new came into the picture of banking, right. But if you look at it in a way it is only your assets are going to be risk weighted, your capital has to be based on that. If some assets are classified as non-performing asset then you also have to make a provision. You have to not only not recognize the income, you still have to make a provision, okay. Now not only for non-performing, you also have to make a small provisioning for even standard assets. That means which are not irregular. Now what is a standard asset? What is a, a substandard asset? Now what is a standard asset? You know, it is a negative definition. What is not non-performing is a standard asset. Okay, so what is it that we need to now look at? What is a non-performing asset? Now non-performing asset depends on repayment 1 and whatever credits come in. Now repayment happens in a term loan. In case of what we call working capital limits which are given or what are called as cash credit accounts or in overdraft accounts, you should be having credits as well as debits, right? The credit that one receives should be covering your interest obligations, at least the interest obligation. If it does not, then it is classified as a substandard asset. That is the first thing that comes into picture, right? Now, I uh, will go to the restructured later on, but uh, let us look at non-performing. Now, interest and or installment, that is 90 days. That means if it is overdue for 90 days, they create buckets less than 90 days, more than 90 days, uh, 90 days to 180 days, all those things, those buckets are created. So here it says 90 days. Now the account remains out of order. Out of order means the amount that has been debited towards interest that has not come by way of credit, then that account is said to be out of order, right? How long is the out of, uh, how long will it be out of order is a thing that determines whether that account is a uh, non-performing or a performing asset. Then the, in case of the banks sometimes buy or discount bills. When the banks discount bills, now most of it will be usance bills. 
Okay, most of it will be Yuzan's bills. Now, what are exactly is Yuzan's bills? Any idea? You have two types of bills. One called as demand bills. That means which you need to be paid on demand. Okay, Yuzan's bills are those where you pay it after a certain period, a certain period, and that requires a stamp duty. There has to be a stamp duty paid on the Yuzan's bills. Now, any uh, a uh, person who is discounting the bills, most of most of the time they will be discounting a Yuzan's bills rather than demand bills. Yes, demand bills also are discounted. It does not mean that it is not discounted. It is discounted, but Yuzan's are discounted more than demand bills. So, even in those, uh, those cases, sometimes they get overdue. And uh, as a banker or a head of the branch, I had that problem where whatever uh, bills we were discounting for Hindustan copper, mind you it is a public sector unit, all were out of order because they never would come before 90 days. They would always be out of order. So half the time you are explaining it is because of this or that. So bill discounting also, if it is not paid within 90 days or the stipulated period, it becomes out of order. Then comes we have agricultural loans. Now, agricultural loans, they do not apply interest all the time. They apply it once in half year or corresponding to the harvesting. So, it depends on what crop and what is the harvesting uh, period for that. That is the time when the interest is applied and collected. So, if that does not come through, it remains overdue for two crop uh, seasons. It can happen when there are droughts or their uh, products are not lifted. So, that is the time they get into this problem. Then uh, in case of uh, agricultural term loans, then it can be. Uh, one quick thing, we will send all these PPTs to you, part 1, 2, 3. So, only write down if you have some original thoughts which is coming to you on the way. Right. So, then we come to we have to classify it in three basic categories. All non-performing assets will be classified on three basic categories. What are those? Substandard assets, doubtful assets, loss assets. This is nothing but what has come from Basel 1. Okay. What is a substandard asset? A substandard asset which has remained an NPA, that means it has been out of order, but for a period not exceeding 12 months. So, there is a weakness there in that particular thing. Basically, we are supposed to monitor that, right. Now, theoretically, we are supposed to monitor, it does not happen. <laughs> then comes the uh, distinct possibility that the bank may sustain loss. So, the compared to a standard asset, this will carry a higher provisioning. Interest is not going to be reckoned. So, all these play a role here. Then comes doubtful asset. What is a doubtful asset? An asset would be classified as doubtful if it has remained in the substandard category for a period of 12 months or more. Then it is said to be doubtful. See, a temporary setback, it is a substandard. If that setback has not been corrected, we are moving into a doubtful. That means we are now doubtful of recovering the loan. That is what it indicates, right. Then again there, we have certain uh, thing doubtful for one year, doubtful for uh, doubtful one, doubtful two, doubtful three. We have various categories and accordingly the provisioning goes up. Okay. Then are the loss assets. A loss asset is where a loss has been identified by the bank or internal or external. Most of the time it will be either the internal or external, not by the bank. The external auditors most of the time point it out. Yeah. Sir, what is uh, stressed assets? Stressed assets means they are already, uh, I mean, they are not uh, paying off your uh, this thing. There is a temporary, this thing, it is almost like your substandard, substandard. But it can get overstressed, then it comes into doubtful. That means you strictly go by 12 months, more than 12 months, and this. See, just after two, 12 months, you may find it that it is not going to work. So, so, it may not be doubtful, it may straight away get into classified into loss, loss asset. So, that decision taking making is by the 
concerned branch or bank head along with the external auditors. Yeah, it can be because of that that we can decide. See, the current Kingfisher thing should have been a loss asset in 2011. Yeah, there are so many. You the list is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How does one monitor this regularly, and what is the risk weight which is given to these? See, uh, monitoring. Normally, what happens is the right now, since all banks are computerized, it gets monitored. It gets monitored because the computer has no bias, nothing. It just goes on the debits and credits and what has come in, what has gone out. Based on that, it throws out a report. Now, this account is substandard, this has to be classified as this. Now, that needs to be followed up by you have in certain banks exclusive credit officers at the branch. Now, they are supposed to follow it up they are supposed to follow it up, right? But most of the time what happens is, one is they do not understand the reports. Second is, you know, the pressure on giving loans is more than pressure on recovering. Now it is changed. Now it is changed. Yeah. Now, see, there was a time, there are even instances of banks, you know, I told you that whatever interest is not apply, you are not supposed to consider the interest if it is a substandard or so. But what happens to that later on? Actually, this interest is to be demarcated into an account called as INC, not Indian National Congress, but interest not collected account, interest not collected account. What happens is, some credit comes in, they forget that we have to first adjust that. The older interest has to be adjusted. They, there was a bank branch which we audited, we found that they had totally forgotten about INC itself. It can be, it can be a huge loss. Of course, the three branch managers who overlooked the INC, they lost their jobs. That is different. In fact, uh, what happens is they, those cases, if it exceed those days, it was one crore, it would come to CBI. So there they will try to look into whether he was personally involved with the borrowers, whether he did it. Because there in CBI, the left hand does not trust the right hand. So it can lead to harassment and this and uh, lots of things. Now here loss asset. That means you have identified the loss and you are going ahead. Now the provisioning also there is a, now it has to make a provision on the basis of classification. Risk weightages, now see, let us take a loan. A loan might have been given, let us say I have given a loan to Suresh. Now he comes under a personal or the retail category. Now what is the security he is giving? What is the security he is giving? Let us say he is giving, let us take his housing loan itself. He is giving a house as the thing. Then the provisioning will be different. Suppose he is giving something else, then the provisioning will be different. Yeah, if it is a floating charge, if it is a floating charge, that means it is on the currently he is doing a business and the charge is on or what he has given as a security is, charge is nothing but the security. If you remember, I had sent one thing for FP Pulse charging of security. <laughs> now, charging is nothing but what you give as security. Now, if it is a floating asset, which is your current assets, then the provisioning is diff totally different because he might be showing it as a receivable. For all that you know, it is not there at all. Like what Kingfisher showed, an intangible asset of 1,200 crores in respect of their brand, which is not being able, uh, which banks are not able to sell it for even 60 crores now. Yeah, no one is bidding for it. You want to add something? <laughs>